Thank you, Pastor Dave, and thank you all for your encouragement. You guys are a loving group, and you do encourage us, um, and so we appreciate you very much. Go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 14. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 34 this morning. And I do want you all to be in an attitude of prayer for me and for each other because we need to deal with some heavy stuff this morning. And this is what God has laid on my heart. Whenever, whenever pastor has me preach, he is uh, very much a, a, a spirit-led man. And so he doesn't ever say, I want you to preach about this. He says, whatever God has laid on your heart is what I want you to preach about. And, and what I want, what I believe God wants to tell us all this morning, myself included, is what it takes to be a true disciple of Christ. And whenever I say that term, the reason I say a true disciple is because in our modern culture, in American society, we have an idea of what it means to be a Christian, of what it requires to be a Christian. I use the terms Christian or disciple or believer. And the, the idea that we have in America is in large, okay? I can't say it absolutely because I know there are faithful men and women in this very room, but as a whole, our idea of what a disciple is, what a disciple does, what a disciple looks like, what it requires to be a disciple is a shamefully far cry from what Christ himself laid down in Scripture. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray, read the text, and then we're just going to dive right in, showing us what Christ requires from his disciples. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray this morning that you would speak through me, that I would give no opinion of my own Father, but Lord, that I would be true to the text. God, I pray that you would just prepare hearts, Father, Everywhere in this room, maybe those that are, will be watching the video, God, to prepare the message that, that you have for us, Lord, and, and I include myself in that, Lord. God, I just ask that you would change us with your word and your Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you so much, God, that even though we deserve nothing less or more than hell, Father, that is what we deserve. That's all we deserve. You in your abundant grace and mercy, have given us so much more. Lord, we love you because you first loved us, and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 14. We're going to read verse 25 through 34. Now, now great multitudes went with him, went with Christ. And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters... Yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and, it is, and he is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Before we get into what Christ lays down as the requirements for discipleship, he talks in verse 25 about the crowds. And I want to address the crowds briefly because I think that the crowd mentality that we see here describes the modern American church for the most part. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, but I believe that I am correct in saying this. It says, Now great multitudes went with him, 
And he turned and said to them, so all of these people are following him. He has amassed great fame at this point in his ministry. He has been traveling around doing miracles, doing healings. He's fed the 5,000 already. He's fed the 4,000. And at the feeding of the 5,000, I want to talk about that specifically for a minute because a lot of these people were following him around and they were his disciples for the wrong reasons. They were curious about him. They had heard, hey, so-and-so's aunt got healed by this guy, Jesus. What's, what's he all about? So they're following him because they're curious. They're following him because maybe they want to be healed. Maybe they're looking for something in that way. They're looking for a healing or they're just watching at a distance because they want to see a show. Or they're literally following because they want something out of him. Okay? There was between fifteen and 20,000 people at the feeding of the 5,000. It says 5,000 men were there besides women and children. So most scholars estimate there was between fifteen and 20,000 people at that event. And in the Gospel of John in chapter 6, what happens is, He's fed the 5,000, and that, that night he set out across the Sea of Galilee. That's when he walked on the water. And so the people that he had fed the day before woke up the next day and didn't know where Jesus was. So they get in their boats, they go across the sea, and they say, Jesus, where have you been? We've been looking for you. And he says, truly I say to you, you didn't come after me. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he says, you didn't come after me because of the miracles you came after me literally because you got a free meal and you want another one. He says, you came because you were fed. Okay, so this is our mentality today. Not ours as individuals and not ours as this church specifically. We, we try to focus on true discipleship. Obviously, we're flawed because we're people, right? But for the most part, we live in a society that is so obsessed with comfort that Jesus is more of a sideshow or he is a, a, a means to an end. We see this manifested today in flippant churches that compromise biblical truth in order to get great crowds. We see it in the lives of individual believers, disciples that compromise the truth of Scripture because they don't want to offend or they want to gain something or they go to church because they want a big show, or church is not a priority to them. They miss church for every and any and every reason. They don't give. And listen, I, I want to be clear about something. I'm not saying that if you've ever missed church, even if it was for a lousy reason, or that you ever skipped tithing, that you're not truly a believer. I'm not saying that at all, but it is the life, it's a life that's marked by these things, where Missing church, missing fellowship with other believers, helping out other believers, sacrificing time and resources for the ministry, if that is a lifestyle pattern, that is a comfortable, casual Christian, and that is not what Christ requires of us. Now, this is some pretty convicting stuff, and I'm saying that from a personal standpoint. I studied this all week, and it's convicting because... Listen, you got to understand something about what Jesus is saying here. This is an evangelistic message. Okay, he is saying this to unbelievers. All right, but there are clear implications for believers. These things that he lays out, he's saying, if you want to be my disciple, this is what's required. Now, us, those of us in this room that are truly disciples of Christ, there are implications for us as well because we can look at this list and say, am I giving Christ my all in this area? Or have I compromised? Have, have I become comfortable? So as we go through this this morning, I want you to take an honest inventory of a couple things. The main thing is, am I truly a disciple of Christ? Or am I just following him at a distance, curious about him, maybe, maybe looking for something out of him. And if you are 
truly a disciple of Christ, I don't, I, I don't, my intention is not to, to make anyone doubt themselves if they're truly a believer, okay? But if you are a true believer, ask yourself, am I living up to this? Is my Lord worth what he asks of me? What does it take to be a disciple of Christ? Number one, you must hate your family. Now, how many think that sounds pretty extreme? Yes, it is. Christ requires extreme devotion. But listen, we have to understand that the word hate, and I'm sure that some of you know this, maybe a lot of you know this, but hate in this passage is not hate like we think about hate. Whenever we hear the word hate in our modern vernacular, it's someone who's an enemy, someone we wish harm upon, that we pit ourselves against, right? That is not what the word means. It is hate by comparison, okay? The same word is used in the book of Malachi whenever God is speaking through the prophet and he says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Did God hate Esau? No, but he chose Jacob as the child of promise, right? He chose him. So by comparison, Esau was, it was more like hate, okay? This, it's the same in Genesis chapter 29. It's the same idea. Um, God is talking about, hey, he looks down upon Leah, right? Jacob's wives, Rachel and Leah. And it says that God looked down upon Leah and saw that she was hated, it does not mean that Jacob literally hated her, okay, but his eyes were for Rachel. Rachel was so far up the list of priorities that Leah, by comparison, it was like he hated her. So it says in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters... Yes, even his own life, he is not, he cannot be my disciple. Obviously, you can't hate your father and mother without violating the fourth commandment, can you? And God never contradicts himself. Ephesians 5 tells you husbands that you are to love your wife as, God, as Christ loves his church. Right? You can't fulfill those requirements if you're hating in the word we use it. It is comparative. It means that Christ, that your allegiance to him, that your devotion to him, that your love for him is so high, it is so absolute, that every other relationship in your life, by comparison, is hatred. Does that make sense? Look at... Matthew 10.37, I believe, is on the screen. Ten, oh, we go back to 10.34. Okay, this is Christ speaking about this same principle. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Does God love to see households in disarray and enemies within a household? No. But listen, it explains further in, in the next verse, Matthew 37. Why is that? Why is it that a man's enemies will be those of his own household? It's because he who loves his father more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Listen, it is talking about you prioritizing your relationship with Christ above that of your own family. Yes, <clears throat> even that sacred cow of ours, your own children. Christ should be more important to you than your kids. Amen? But we don't live that way. We put human relationships in front of that of Christ, and therefore we are not worthy to be his disciples. Listen, I want to talk about just a few examples of how this actually plays out in our lives, because it's, it's one thing to say, oh yeah, I, 
I love Jesus so much that compared to the, my, the rest of my family, it's like, hey, yeah, I love him that much, but what does that really look like? <clears throat> These are just a few I thought of, and maybe you can even think of a relationship right now that you have prioritized above Christ, above your relationship with Christ. Are you dating someone that is not a believer or that you don't know if they're a believer or not? If that describes you, that is a relationship that needs to go away because you are compromising your biblical integrity. Well, I just, I love him so much. I just like him so much. No, by comparison, that should be more like hate. Does that make sense? If you are compromising your, the truth of the scripture in order to accommodate a relationship just because you fancy someone, that's not what a disciple of Christ looks like. What about your kids? Do you discipline your children, those of you who have children? If you don't, and a lot of believers don't, listen, you are saying that your relationship with your kid is more important than the biblical command of Christ to discipline your children. Do you realize that? Well, I don't, I don't want to spank him because I want him to like me. Because I want to build up their self-esteem. No. That is less important than your relationship with Christ. And it's ironic because whenever you do that, whenever you coddle a child and don't discipline them, then usually that ends up severing a relationship later on in life. So it's kind of ironic. But we look at it that way, right? <clears throat> what about your parents? You know, we... Uh, knew a missionary family whenever we were in Springfield, and they were about to go to, to Wales, okay, a husband and wife and a few kids. And this wife, they were about to leave to go to Wales, and her parents, her mother specifically, was very adverse to it. She tried to guilt trip her, tried to talk her out of it. I'm not going to ever get to see my grandkids. But listen, that missionary... Christ was such a high priority in her life that it didn't matter what her mom said. Because by comparison, her relationship with her mother would be closer to hate. It wasn't because she loved her mother less, okay? We still love our kids, we still love our spouses, our parents, and all that. But it's, it's not loving them less to accommodate Christ, it's putting Christ up so much higher. Her dedication her devotion was absolute to Christ mom I'm doing this and it doesn't matter if I never see you again obviously she didn't want that but if that was the cost then it was worth it you must hate your family by comparison the same principle goes for yourself how many of you have ever said or believed, I would die for Jesus? I would die for him. We say that, okay, and I, I believe it, those of you that's, that say that, yeah, I would die for Jesus if I had to. But it's easy, it's a little bit easier for us to say it because we live in a country where that's probably never going to happen, right? I mean, let's just be honest. I'm not doubting your sincerity, but it's easy to, to claim that. But listen, it's so much more than that. It's so much more than just theoretically being willing to die for Christ. It's living for him day to day, denying yourself day by day. You know what? I have goals. I have ambitions. I want to accomplish this, but Christ is so much more important to me than my own self, than my own desires, than my own dreams, that if that's what Jesus requires of me, I will gladly set them aside. We must hate our family we must hate our own selves by comparison, right? In the light of Christ, are we denying ourselves? Are we denying our relationships in that way? Are we subjecting them to Christ? Another way to look at it is, have you ever suffered rejection by someone? Or maybe you had a friend that said, you are too much for me. I... I I can't deal with this anymore, or something like that. Have you ever sacrificed a relationship on any level for Christ? 
Number one, in order to be a disciple of Christ, you must hate your family. He says, you cannot be my disciple. Number two, carry your cross. What does that mean? Verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, what did the cross of Christ mean? What did it entail? What did Christ suffer on the cross for us? Physical pain, right? That's the first thing I think of. He suffered physical pain. We have a missionary uh, Jerry Daniels, there in Kenya. He broke his leg this week. He is literally suffering for Christ right now, and his wife is too. She, I, they just sent me an email last night. She is having to boil the bones of cows to extract the marrow so that he can eat it, so that it will help him recover faster. But he is suffering. He broke his leg serving Christ in Kenya. Jaron Rogers, our missionary to Nicaragua, he was robbed last month. He is literally suffering for Christ, and he's also broken his leg. Wasn't it his leg he broke? That was more out of him being a little bit reckless, but still. He is in Nicaragua, and he and his family are suffering for Christ right now. Old Conorup. Another missionary of ours had a heart attack last year. He is on the field. These people are out literally suffering for Christ. But it's not just that. And in America, we don't really usually have to suffer much physical pain. We do sometimes. But listen, it's, the cross is so much more than that. Bearing your cross and what Christ bore on the cross is so much more than just the physical pain. Think about the humiliation that he went through. Have you ever thought about that? Christ is on trial. They are shouting crucify him. He's humiliated by his guards. They mocked him, put a robe on him, put a crown of thorns on him. Yes, it was painful, but it's also humiliation. He drug his cross through the city while people spat on him and mocked him. And then he hung on the cross. For a lot of us, just being on display is humiliating enough, right? Public speaking and being in front of people is the number one fear in the world. So just being on display sounds awful enough, but think about being on display, hanging on a cross, not even besides the physical pain, people mocking you and hurling insults at you. Christ had thieves on either side that were also mocking him. It was humiliating. He was rejected. His disciples scattered. Right, The crowds that were following him, that welcomed him into Jerusalem, had almost entirely rejected him. Almost everybody in the city had turned against him in just a week. Absolute rejection. So what about us? If we are disciples of Christ, we must bear a cross. Have you ever suffered for Christ? And I mean really suffered. John MacArthur told a story about a woman. I just heard this in a message, and I was reminded of it this morning. But he had a woman that came to him, and she said, I feel like I'm really suffering for Christ. Can I meet with you? And he said, yeah, of course. What's going on? And so she met with him and she said, I'm getting the carpet in my house redone and I just cannot figure out what drapes I want to get to match it. I just, I feel like I'm under attack and I'm really suffering for the gospel. It's okay to laugh because that's stupid. But listen, have you ever really suffered? I started out by telling you that I I wanted you to do an honest inventory of yourself. Christ tells us that if we are going to be his disciples, we, we are going to suffer. If you have never suffered for Christ in any sense of the word, I cannot sit up here and say you're definitely not a believer, you're definitely not a disciple, but it should be a red flag. We have this comfortable notion of discipleship in our country 
where it's, well, I said a prayer when I was 12, and then I go to church every Sunday. I give an hour of my week, and usually half of that hour is dedicated to thinking about Golden Corral afterwards. That's what we think of as discipleship today. Look at Matthew 10.38, I believe, is up here. This is Christ. He reiterated this point frequently. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. If you are not willing to suffer for Christ, you're not worthy of him. Maybe you've heard this saying before, but I can't remember who I heard it from, but it, the saying is, we all want a crown without a cross. Well, it doesn't work that way. Because if you're not willing to bear the cross, you are not worthy of the crown. And listen, this is not a one-time thing. This is a daily sacrifice, okay? We must be willing to suffer continually if that's what's necessary. Look at Luke 9, 23. Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross once. And take up his cross on Sunday. And take up his cross once in a while. No, how often do we need to take up our cross and deny ourselves? Daily. This culture is, is so opposed to this. It's not about self-denial. It's about... What's in it for me? What can I get? What am, it's all about me. It's not about suffering. Our culture that we live in is so opposed to this. Amen? But if we are going to be true disciples of Christ, we must deny ourselves. We must take up our cross daily. We must be willing to suffer for him. Have you ever suffered for Christ? If you knew that it would require you to suffer every single day for the rest of your life, would you be willing? Would Christ be worth it to you? Number three, forsake worldly comfort. And I think that this is the biggest hang-up we have. We must be willing to forsake worldly comfort comfort if we are going to be a disciple of Christ, a true disciple. Verse 28, <clears throat> for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Listen. Christ wants you to count the cost and know that he is worthy of it, whatever that may be, even if that's everything. This is ten verses, and five of those he dedicates to counting the cost. You know, I grew up in the generation of altar calls, and there's nothing wrong with altar calls, right? You call upon Christ, I believe that's biblical, but listen, the problem with that is a lot of times, not always, a lot of times it is very hard for us to sincerely count the cost of following Christ. And that's why so many of the people, at least in my circle, that were saved that way walked away from the faith. Because we don't count the cost. Christ wants us to count the cost and be willing to pay. Listen, we must be willing to forsake everything we have. This word forsake in your Bible, it may say abandon or renounce. It literally is translated to say goodbye to it. So we must come to the realization, it's, this is not theoretical. Well, yeah, I'd be willing to do it. That's great. That's a great start. I'm willing to do it. But are you actually doing it? Now, that, does that mean 
give away everything you have and be homeless? No. God wants you to use common sense. He wants you to take care of yourself and he wants you to take care of your family. That's biblical. But listen, are you sincerely sacrificing? And it's primarily focused on material things, okay? But it's not just that. It's, it's primarily talking about that. Are you willing to give up what you have to follow Christ? Look at the... Uh, turn a couple pages to Luke 18. We're going to look at the rich young ruler. We talked about this in Sunday school last week. This is an example of a man counting the cost and saying, I'll pass. Luke 18, verse 18, starting in verse 18. Now, a certain ruler, meaning he was a temple ruler, he was a big shot at the temple, asked Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but the one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he, the rich young ruler, says to Jesus, all these things I have kept from my youth. Now that in and of itself is doubtful, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that he, in fact, kept all of those perfectly since he was a youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Verse 23, but when he heard this, he became very sorrowful for he was very rich. Now this man asks Jesus, this young man asks him, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does not tell him about salvation by grace, through faith alone in Christ. Instead, he says, you got to sell everything. Why did he do that? Because this, this, this really happened. It's, it illustrates a point to us, but this is a true story. But he's illustrating that this young man was not willing to pay the price of discipleship. The price being sell or be willing to say goodbye to everything you have of this world. We have a missionary that we support in this church. His name's Stan Sherwood. And if you have ever watched his, his deputation video, he says that he had a new house, new truck, a great job that was comfortable and that paid really, really well. He was set up. Christ called him to the country of Panama. This is a man who had to count the cost. Is this worth it? Is it worth it for me to give up this salary, to give up my retirement, to give up my house, to go to a third world country and preach the gospel? And the answer for him was yes. That's one example of discipleship. He counted the cost and he knew that Christ was worthy. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. This is Paul. Now, Paul was kind of a big deal. Okay? He had the education, he had the intelligence, he had the money, he had everything. He was, he was trained under Gamaliel, which was like, like going to Harvard today. He was, he was the man to study under. And so he is thinking and talking about all the things that he gave up for Christ. But whatever things were gained to me, his education, his money, his wealth, his status, he had great status. Those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Listen, this is the same principle as hating your family. It is, it is comparative. Paul had all these things. Not necessarily bad things. Money, having money is not a bad thing. Having a good reputation and status and stuff, that's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Having a good education and all that is, is not a... There's, those aren't bad things, Okay? But listen, he's saying that Christ 
is so much more valuable to him that he doesn't say that I'm indifferent about him. Well, I love Jesus so much that all that stuff is, you know, I, I could care less about it. No, it's Jesus is so much more that it's actually counted as loss to him. For who I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Listen, Paul was a man who was dedicated to the gospel, amen? He lived out these principles that Christ is telling us that he requires. Complete abandonment of worldly comfort for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. Following Christ is not casual, it is not part-time, it's not this quasi, yeah, I'm going to have a little bit of Jesus here, a little bit of Jesus there. It is complete and absolute dedication in all areas of life. That is what Christ requires for discipleship. I want you to listen to what happened to several of the church fathers, okay? These are men who understood the cost of following Christ and who embraced it, knowing that he is, in fact, worthy. James, the son of Zebedee, this is the only account that's actually in Scripture of what happened to, to one of the apostles. He was, it says he was put to death by the sword by Herod. Now, that means that he was either stabbed to death, but more likely he actually had his head chopped off. Now, although the rest of these that I'm going to tell you about are not in Scripture, they are verifiable, historic, they're part of church history. Matthew was wounded with a sword in Ethiopia as he was preaching the gospel, and he died of a sword wound. John was boiled in oil. Think about just that. He survived that. And so then he was cast out to a prison island called Patmos. It was a mining camp, basically. Okay? So this old man who had just been boiled in oil had to go be an outcast on a prison island. And then he got released from there eventually and died of natural causes after that. James, Jesus' brother, not an apostle, but certainly a leader in the early church, was thrown off the top of the temple. Now, he didn't die. These, the people threw him off the top of the temple and saw that he landed on the ground and survived, so they ran downstairs and beat him to death with clubs. Bartholomew, he had his skin flayed open by seven soldiers whipping him. And then... He survived that, so what they did was they stretched him out on a cross, but they didn't nail him to it because they wanted him to survive as long as possible, so they tied him to it with ropes. He survived for two days preaching the gospel that whole time. Andrew was crucified in Greece on an X-shaped cross. Thomas was stabbed with a spear as he was preaching in India. Matthias, the disciple that replaced Judas, was burned to death. Paul, this Paul who counted all things lost, he was tortured by Nero, the emperor of the time, who hated Christians. He hated Christ. So he tortured Paul to death and then, or he tortured him and then had him beheaded. And then Peter, what happened to Peter was Nero set the city of Rome on fire. He burned his own city to the ground so that he could tell everyone that it was Christians that did it to make him look bad. So Peter, after all that, Christians were suffering persecution because of Rome burning to the ground. He was crucified upside down on a cross as a result of that. Now compare that, and that's just a few. We could look at throughout history, not just people who were martyrs. I think of Charles Spurgeon. He preached and preached and preached through chronic depression and gout, and uh, I think he had rheumatitis. He was suffering through intense emotional and physical pain, but that did not stop him from being a faithful preacher of the gospel. John Calvin, 
was condemned by the Roman church. He had to go into hiding. It actually actually made it illegal for anyone. It wasn't just illegal for him to preach or to write. It was actually illegal for anyone to even help him, to give him anything to eat or to give him a place to stay. And of course, that that doesn't even touch the tip of the iceberg going throughout church history, the people who have not just been martyrs, okay? That's what we think about, but who have suffered for the sake of Christ and who have been willing to count the cost and say, you know what, I will suffer the loss of relationships. I will suffer the loss of, of my own comfort because Christ is worthy. Christ concludes this in verse 34 by saying, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its favor, flavor, how shall it be seasoned? We are called to be salt. We are called to be a preservative. He's talking about his disciples. But if it loses its flavor, it's not good for anything. And so it's thrown out. Listen, the part-time, casual, so-called disciple, Christ does not have a use for that. Now that sounds pretty depressing, but I want also I want to go back to the story of the rich young ruler right after this. I know we're running a little bit over, but I don't care. After the story of the rich young ruler and he walks away, Peter says to Christ, See, we have left all and followed you. And Christ says, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Listen, we don't follow Christ for rewards. We follow him because he's worthy. But Christ, because he pours grace upon grace upon grace on us, promises that there is a reward. So I want to conclude really quick with two questions. I know that your notes were sparse today, but I left plenty of space for you to ask this first question. What am I withholding? What am I withholding from Christ? Is it that relationship that I know is not honoring to Christ Is it that material thing? Is it that attitude? Is it my pride? Listen, is it my so-called freedom? We live in a culture that is obsessed with entitlement and with our own rights. Listen, if you are a disciple of Christ, you have no rights. Have you ever thought about that? Why? You have no rights. You You should have no sense of entitlement because... Everything about you is in Christ. So you have no right to complain about you not getting yours. What am I withholding? Is it that attitude of entitlement that needs to be laid at the foot of the cross? What is it in your life? Why do you not evangelize? Is it because you're worried about your reputation? Is it because you're afraid of rejection? What are you withholding? And number two, is Christ worthy? Now what I mean by that is if you have something that the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind, yes, this is something I'm holding on to. I have not turned it over to Christ. Is he worthy of giving up that thing? Is he worthy of it? Is he worthy of hindering some kind of earthly relationship because of him? Is he worthy of sacrificing whatever? I'm gonna I don't want to give because I don't want my cable to get shut off. I know that's a pretty feeble example, but you get the idea. Is Jesus Christ worthy of giving up that thing? He says that if you are unwilling, then you cannot be his disciple. Is he more worthy than that thing you're clinging to? We're going to pray, and then we are going to sing.
All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Jesus, I surrender. I hope that's your prayer this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, even though we don't like conviction generally, I am thankful for the conviction this this brings, that it's brought upon me. Father, because we know that conviction is a good thing because it leads to more Christ-likeness. And God, I pray that we would not try, to, not try to change the things in our life that we need to change because of some legalistic sense of the word, God, but because we recognize that you are worthy. Christ, you died for us. You gave up everything for us. We did not deserve it. And so, Lord, I pray that we would remember that. Bring that to our minds. Help us to always be dwelling on it so that we know, Father, we don't, we don't follow rules just for the sake of following rules because you told us to, but it's because we love you, because you loved us so much. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, that you would just convict us where conviction is needed, Lord and that, uh, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, through your word, would just change hearts this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for our salvation. And God, I pray if anybody here this morning does not know you as Savior, that you would draw them to you, that they would count the cost and look at the sacrifice you made, your death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, and that they would say, yes, Lord, you are worthy. Yes, Lord, you are worthy for me to sacrifice everything, even my own life, if that's what's required. God, that we would recognize your true value. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.